Thank you, Fred. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is our second and maybe annual symposium and dinner. We haven't finally decided that yet, but we're working on it. Um, we're delighted to see so much interest in housing and health. Uh, it's obviously a very important subject today, and it's one that we have been thinking about and working on for some time. Um, we've been long aware that, our, that many Americans not only lack housing, but are also chronic users of our hospitals and, er and emergency rooms. And we're gathered here today to tackle the issue of housing and health in a collaborative way, because the affordable housing industry can't do it alone. So we're very pleased that many in healthcare and other sectors are joining us today to work on this dual goal, housing the neediest while improving their healthcare outcomes. What we're really calling for today, I think, is an affordable housing paradigm shift, one that examines the intersection of housing and health, exploring ways that housing and healthcare providers can improve outcomes by changing the current financial structure. This could include a new funding model, privatized housing vouchers. To kick off today's program, we're honored to recognize a bipartisan group of lawmakers working to sustain and improve the preservation and creation of affordable housing. And I think one of the things that um, we and others in the affordable housing industry have been so pleased about is the way that support in Congress is coming from both sides of the aisle for affordable housing, particularly the LIHTC program. We'd like to begin um, by honoring our, our attendees with the National Housing Partnership Foundation Affordable Housing Trailblazer Award, first awarded last year to Senators Orrin Hatch and Maria Cantwell. We're going to begin by honoring Representative Jim Himes, Democrat of Connecticut, who, after, who introduced the Pay for Success Affordable Housing Energy Modernization Act, a piece of legislation with the intent to increase energy efficiency in affordable multifamily housing nationwide. Uh, many of you may remember that our symposium last year was on the subject of Pay for Success. So we're proud that Representative Hines' home state of Connecticut is the location of several of NHPF's properties. Please join me in welcoming our first 2018 Affordable Housing Trailblaker, Representative Jim Hines. Richard, thank you, and thank you to the NHP. I'm very touched um, by this honor. Uh, some of you know, because some of you may have worked with me at Enterprise Community Partners or in other uh, affordable housing ventures around, uh, around the country. Uh, this is deeply personal, um, and uh, I spend a lot of time on Capitol Hill trying to make the point that while affordable housing may not be number one, two, or three on people's top priority issues, uh, list of priorities, um, if we really care about economic opportunity, if we really care about diverse communities that include the seniors who grew up there and the teachers who work there, um, and if we really care about uh, being able to move people from a place where perhaps economic opportunity is not to a place economic is, the economic opportunity is, uh, we'll be very, very serious. Uh, about this topic, and we won't just make more affordable housing, which we need to do, but we'll do smart affordable housing, green affordable housing, near jobs, near transportation, near good schools, near the kinds of services that, of course, allow people to uh, live the American dream. So this is a terrific group of people. Thank you for this, but more importantly, thank you for the amazing work you do every single day. <clears throat> We also um, are pleased to be honoring Representative Carlos Curbelo, Republican of Florida, who is the lead Republican on the House version of the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act. Representative Curbelo couldn't be here today, but he has sent Ashley Rose on his behalf. Ashley, is she here? Sure. 
Thank you so much to the foundation, and thank you for hosting this event. Um, the congressman obviously wanted to be here today. Unfortunately, he's, he's back in Florida now, but this is a huge issue for South Florida, particularly in the Florida Keys. So we're going to continue trying to work on strengthening and improving the tax credit moving into next Congress. Thank you. We also want to recognize Senator Susan Collins, Republican of Maine, who chairs the Senate Aging Committee and recently received the Brooke Award, which goes to an exemplary housing leader with a record of fighting for affordable housing at the national level. The Senator has sent Jason Woolwine on her staff to accept this award. Jason. Uh, Senator Collins sends her regrets, of course, uh, and certainly appreciates NHPF elevating the conversation on affordable housing. It's something that she cares about deeply, both uh, on the role as aging, as well as chairman of the Senate Appropriations on Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development. Thank you very much. And finally, although she's unable to be with us today, we want to award Representative Susan Del Bene Democrat of Washington, who introduced the Access to Affordable Housing Act to increase housing credits by 50%, which could result in as many as 400,000 more affordable housing units developed over 10 years. She is also a co-sponsor of the Bipartisan Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act, a comprehensive bill to strengthen and expand the tax credit. Um, so Susan will get her award separately. So thank you, and a round of applause for all our recipients today. Thank you, Dick, for perfectly setting the stage for the next part of our program. All of us here today have a vested interest in the affordable housing in the present and in the future. There are a lot of unknowns on the horizon, and the industry needs to be proactive to protect and ensure a positive, affordable housing future. So we've assembled some of the best and brightest today to start brainstorming. We are beginning with a presentation by Ryan Moser, Vice President, Strategy and Impact for the Corporation for Supportive Housing, or CSH who will provide an overview of housing and health care today and how housing and health care are becoming increasingly intertwined. Ryan will share examples of how supportive housing has developed cross-sector partnerships which help people living in extreme poverty and engaged in crisis services find stability in the community and generate positive health and financial returns. CSH was instrumental in educating the NHP Foundation and our resident services affiliate, Operation Pathways, about PSH and preparing us to both house and support residents at our Clem Manor property in Houston, Texas. Ryan sees affordable housing as an underutilized resource for public health public safety, and human service systems, which can be developed as backbone infrastructure for resilient and equitable communities. We hope he will provoke a rich conversation with you and our panelists as we grapple with the question of what will it take for all of us to meet this challenge. Ryan? Thank you, Fred. Let's see. Um, can you still hear me? All right, great. OK, so hi, I'm Ryan. Thank you, Fred, for the lovely introduction. And thank you all for um, having me here today, the NHP Foundation, when I got to start talking with them uh, just a while back. Um, was just a tremendous opportunity to see people that see things in much the same way I do. And to see that reflected in an affordable housing developer as they are moving into the services space further and more strongly is for me, from the supportive housing sector, uh, just something delightful to see. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, 
supportive housing, my experience therein, and what I think that it means for affordable housing. How I think the lessons that we've had to learn in supportive housing can be instructive for the work that you all are doing. All right, so CSH has been around for 27 years. We have been sort of in the throes of it, uh, looking at the intersection of health, uh, human services, housing, how that ties together for people that are extremely vulnerable with exceptional uh, poverty uh, status, uh, facing just a lot of barriers to stability, right? That's what we do, that's our DNA, that's how we've cut our teeth. Uh, but really we work to improve the lives of vulnerable people, help maximize public dollars, and uh, build safer, stronger, healthier communities. All right, so supportive housing, for those that are less familiar, is basically just affordable housing on steroids, right? There's a lot of ways that we can talk about it, try to uh, be sophisticated, but when I think about affordable housing, I think about affordable housing for people that are, you know, somewhere between 30 and maybe 120% of the area income uh, with a variety of needs in place, right? When I think about supportive housing, supportive housing is titrated for people that are zero, usually to 15% income, and that's kind of where people kind of cap out at the entry point, right? When we think about resident services, we think about something that's a little bit hard to define, but coordinated community services to help people connect. Supportive housing is more of an intensive case management model. It's flexible, it's voluntary. It can really go help people connect to their community in a different way than the resident services and affordable housing can do. Right? That's what supportive housing is. It's that combination of the two that creates the opportunity, and it's that combination of the two that I think sets the stage for where we're going today. You know, so uh, I think about opportunity as a conflux of resources, knowledge, um, and need. Right? So just a moment on need. Now, starting off with need, we did our first national supportive housing needs assessment about two years ago, and we found out that about 1.2 million, per our count, 1.2 million people across the United States households need supportive housing, right? And that's overwhelming for me. I look at that number every day. It's still overwhelming for me. It's a large number, right? But you're used to big numbers. Affordable housing is used to an $8 to $12 million cost burden gap. Right, looking at the need for affordable housing in the country. However, big million, million numbers are, are tough to understand, so I, I thought we'd just look locally at D.C. So here in D.C., there are about 4,000 people from our census that, that we think need supportive housing on a given day. Right? And you can see in that, don't try to read the print, I know it's too small. You can see in that pie chart, right, there are people coming from the justice system, there are people coming from homelessness sector, there are people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, there are seniors, uh, people that are stuck in nursing homes, there are people in institutional care, group homes, right? Those are the kind of places that we see people show up when they have inadequate access to housing and services, right? Generally, they are exceptionally high need, right? So there are people with multiple barriers to stability. They may have multiple co-occurring disorders, uh, addiction and mental health issues, right? They may just have had a really long and challenged life with a lot of trauma, and it takes time to unpack those issues, all right? But to understand need, we also have to look a little bit deeper, right? So it helps to go beyond just the big map of saying, okay, in DC there are 4,000 people. This is a map, this is actually generated from New York Times Opportunity Atlas. If you haven't taken a look, you should, right? So you can plug in your address, it'll tell you a whole lot of things about yourself that you didn't know, including where you live matters, right? So to NHP's uh, tagline, right? Where you live matters. Depending on where you live on this map of DC, Right, and that bright red area, those dark red areas, that's where you are likely to have an adult income of about $10,000 or less if you grew up in those areas in a family with middle income, right? Whereas if you are in the blue shaded areas, the dark blue areas, you are likely to have an income of $95,000 or above annual. That's a big shift, right? And when you think about those corridors of need, you look at those densities, those are neighborhoods, right? And those are a complex, interesting place to think about, right? So we know that where you live matters, but we also know that who you are matters. This next visualization is the same map, but here it's coded for people that are white, right? And we see a very different picture, right? So here we see a whole lot more blue. We see the vestiges of segregation in housing policy, right? Because we see whole areas that just don't intersect, right? If we flip it, and we look at people of color, people, African-American people in particular, right? Now we're seeing the inverse. So as a CDFI, CSH is a CDFI, we make loans to invest in projects. We come from the CDFI industry, which was born from redlining, 
right? It was a response to redlining and discriminatory housing policy. That's where we came from. We need to be cognizant of that, right? And what we see over and over and over again is this pattern repeat. So it's not just about poverty, right? It's about criminal justice, it's about child welfare, it's about health disparities, right? It's about access to schools and education, it's about employment, right? Over and over. And these corridors of need, again, we start to take on a different uh, flavor, right? So we start to think about a neighborhood where you're layering issues, one on top of another. And then you think about a person in that neighborhood trying to make their way out, make their way through, and the different complexities that they have to deal with, All right? Here's another stab at this same map, right? <laughs> gonna keep, uh, this one's just slimmed down a little bit so you can pull out DC a little bit uh, more clearly, right? And hopefully you can see here these black dots. And these black dots are where NHP's properties are, right? So I could have pulled this map up for really any property that they run in the country, you'd have seen the same pattern. We're pretty close to it, I would bet, right? So you see them aligning with those corridors of need that we saw, right? That vertical stripe sort of going north, right? And that southwestern uh, tier of DC, right? Affordable housing, why do you need to care about this, right? And the reason is because affordable housing is a neighbor of need. You live in the community, you work in the community, you are the community that is facing these challenges. The good news is that you are not alone as a neighbor, right? There are a lot of other people here too. So we can think about here, we're looking at health centers that align with this area, right? Hospital systems. They are facing the same challenges that you are facing. Here we're adding in youth rehabilitation facilities. So correctional involvement for young people, same neighborhoods, right? This is a broader spread, but here we see education. You think about schools and how they overlay with your work, right? These are your partners. These are your potential partners and if we look at them not as just a, a group of systems that aren't working together, but as a group that we can bring together to generate new resources, generate structures and supports, right, it becomes a powerful potential alliance at that local level. All right, so I'm gonna tell you about a project that we ran at, at CSH. It's one of our signature initiatives. It's FUSE. I think it's instructive for what we've had to do to reimagine the way that we do our work, right? So that bar chart there, there's, you can see there's blues and there's purples and the writing's too small for me to see right now. But let's say right now that the blues are time spent in shelter, right? And the purples are time spent in jail, right? That's a two year span of a person's life. That's an actual human being. That's two year span of a person's life. The times in gray are the only times where the system didn't know where they were. And I guarantee you from experience, they were likely in a group home, they were likely in detox, they were likely in an ER right, bouncing around between health facilities because over and over as I engage with this group of folks, that's what we see, right? <clears throat> when we started this program, we basically said, what if we looked at this bar chart and we saw something different? What if we didn't see a person with a problem? What if we saw a person that was missing critical resources, right, and by providing them, we could actually see them as an asset? How could we change their behavior? How could we help them access new resources to change their life and impact our system, right? And people thought we were nuts, right? This is 13 years ago. People were just uh, apoplectic about this, right? So a lot of our great allies said, this is insane. You're wasting public money. These folks are unhousable. You do not uh, know what you're doing. You should walk away, right? And those were the nice comments, right? But some people got it, and they moved forward, right? And it's easy to say no to a bar chart. So we put 100 people in housing, right? But the reality is that the 100 people were actual people. And this, the picture that's up there is a gentleman that I know named Barry. He was one of those first 100 people that was housed 13 years ago, right? And Barry was all the, all the things you would think. He had a rap sheet as long as his arm. He had been now to hospitals, uh, mental health institutions. He has traumatic uh, head injuries in his past, right? Long histories of addiction. Uh, really, just you would walk by him on the street and just shudder. Just did not look like he was in a human state, right? A really sad position to be in. Right? This is Barry 13 years later. Barry is still housed. Barry uh, makes art out of small, like classroom chalk. He carves it. He's been featured in a museum. Um, he volunteers at his local church. He occasionally has a relapse. And you know what? He has neighbors. He has a community. He has a service provider that help him reconnect. Right? And he stays in his housing. He keeps that stability. He stays out of those systems. And he does that work himself. Nobody does that for him. Right? He also writes poetry. Right? For me, 
These numbers that are up here, which is what the program looks like later, are a kind of poetry. I'm a bit of a dork, you know, I'm kind of a nerd. So, so for me, I like, I like numbers, right? And these tell me a story, they sing to me, right? So we see reductions in recidivism, we see reductions in emergency utilization, we see reductions in shelter use, we see housing stability, we see employment increase, right? And these, resor these uh, programs over and over have been replicated. We've done this initiative more than 30 times across the country, and they always point in this direction. You know, the, uh, the impossible dream can actually, is perfectly possible, right? The unhousable person doesn't exist. They can be housed, people can make their way through, right? We just have to find the right combination of resources. You know, the other reason that I like uh, thinking about Barry is that Barry, for me, uh, is an easy success story to miss, right? It's hard to see his potential because in order to see it in the state that he was in, you have to really be able to look up from below. Right? You have to be able to see up and think about things in a different way. Right? So in order to do FUSE, we had to completely revamp the way that we did our housing uh, recruitment. We had to change from a passive model to an active outreach strategy. We had to go into jails, meet people repeatedly, engage them until they were in housing. Right? We had to completely revamp the way we did our screening. We had to stop screening people out pretty consistently in every single bucket of resources that we tried to use. Right, and we had to flip that on its head and go and find those people and prioritize them actually for housing. Right? And we had to think about services in a different way because Barry, like a lot of people, had had so many contacts. There was this great built up um, sort of distrust of a system and it took a long time for him to think that we were real. All right, but the, the other neat thing is that when you make this happen, right, it opens the door. So we see social determinants kind of in that same spot. Right? And we're looking up and trying to figure out. The research on social determinants, until fairly recently, was mostly focused on lead, asbestos, uh, chipping paint, right? mold issues. All very important and issues which by themselves make it worthwhile to rehabilitate affordable housing. Right? Just, just by themselves. Right? But beyond that, being able to see the lack of housing for a similar kind of a condition, being able to see that people that do not housing, have housing have disruption, they have trauma, they are bouncing between systems and it creates damage, right? And that damage affects health. Well, that's a much harder research question, right? The good news is that, in fact, that research is being done in a lot of different places and it's starting to show resources. We have initiatives in CSH, uh, that CSH has been involved with around health, family well-being, child welfare, youth aging out of foster care, uh, seniors leaving nursing home care, uh, people exiting prison, people exiting uh, incarceration, active substance use, really all over the place, right? And all of them show these uh, patterns, right? Which is that you move from a system where, when you put those ingredients together, you move from a system where you have dysfunction to a system where you start to see acute turn into prevention, where you see crisis turn into stability, right? And where you see damage turn into growth. And that's where we want to be headed. All right, so I think that pre presents a, just a tremendous opportunity. When you think about those neighborhoods, what we're looking at, that scale of need that we're talking about, um, it's, it's a huge opportunity for affordable housing. Because again, supportive housing is just affordable housing on steroids. Right? It's just amped up to be able to work with people with a deeper set of needs. Right? And you can do that. But in order to get there, you're going to have to go through a reboot. We, in the affordable housing industry, will have to go through that same type of reboot to be able to think. I, my uh, partner pointed out to me, because she likes to point things out, that uh, reboot is now a, a regular term. So anybody under 25, I apologize. There is no more rebooting. We just turn it back on or something. I don't know. But I'm, I'm a little bit older, so I still see this. <laughs> right? But there are a couple key things that we have to think about. And so I'm going to pose about five different issues for us to talk through. Uh, and for people to think about on the panel, I'm going to try to connect it on our panel. And just some ideas from supportive housing and affordable housing that might be leading the way. All right, so the first one is redefining who affordable housing is for. Sorry, I'm going to pull these out so I don't miss this one. So redefining who affordable housing is for. Right now, structurally, you are screening out in affordable housing all of the people that I care about. Right? Unless you are bending over backwards, and some of you are, bending over backwards to find out ways to do it, they are not getting into your housing, right? Because they have complex criminal justice histories, uh, rent arrears, utility arrears. They have had 
uh, long experiences, but they, they're not at the top of your income stack, right? So if you're at that zero to 50% AMI, who are you gonna pick? The person that's at 0% AMI or the 12 people that are at 50% AMI right next to them in line, right? So they're getting screened out passively through your systems, right? In order to be able to approach this stuff, in order to be able to make the partnerships that we need, we have to create a new way of looking at that process, right? And that means creating alignment with partners, looking at referral systems, looking at data in different ways, thinking about how we can bring those systems into our playing, into our sandbox, right? And the good news is, again, if you do it, it will work. These are not people that are not houseable. These are people that can be just as well and stably involved in your communities and add just as much as anybody else. They're just not a fit right now, right? So we have today, uh, uh, as the commissioner of HPD, Maria, a person who is deft at weaving together capital and operating streams, service streams, and different partners and alliances, right? You think of her like a conductor of the Philharmonic for housing resources, right? She can help you through this journey. Next piece is we have to think about data. Those data points that I pulled up before, the types of outcomes that we're starting to see in, in support of housing, are hard fought. That's 10 years of working on research over and over and over again. Sometimes running into brick walls, sometimes not, right? And it is a, fo a constant focus on data and figuring out what you know about yourselves, what you have to offer, and how to bring it to bear, right? What the impacts are on people and communities. Affordable housing needs to run full bore at data and figure out how to enter partnerships, look at data sharing agreements, uh, look at your data with fresh eyes, look at consistent outcomes across different providers, right? So looking at this space is something that you can and should do. Uh, Josh is here. Uh, Josh was involved in a five city uh, initiative, a four city initiative that we did looking at high utilizers of health across the country. He was involved in a randomized control study uh, and it showed that in their local site they were able to generate health study, health outcomes uh, in their program by creating this stuff, right? By moving through, by understanding data, by looking at who they were using their housing to target, right? Next step on that stuff is thinking about data without context just makes no sense, right? Data without context is just noise, right? So we have Stephen here who's thinking about how do you pull together housing, right? With health services. How do you think about aligning emergency metal? If you want to know what your data means, you need to know what it means to somebody else. So as we get to know how the healthcare industry, we need to understand not just what data they have, but what do they care about? Is it a HEDA score? Do you know what that means? Right? If not, you should. Right? Is it about their flow in the emergency room? Or is it about somebody that's being readmitted for multiple conditions or multiple visits under the same condition? Those, those differences matter. So Josh and Stephen can be our Rosetta Stone for the conversation. All right, so thinking about investing in services and partnerships uh, for delivery. for a number of years. Uh, it's a 10-year program. It was funded by Health Philanthropy largely. And it was basically set up to work with affordable housing developers uh, to create a stronger resident services model that was very data-driven and with clear outcomes and thinking about what is it that we would term success? How would we know if the program worked? Because resident services are one of those things like supportive housing, it's just very hard to grasp. You don't quite know what they mean. It's just like, well, you know, we do services and it's in partnership with the community. We bring people in, we have referrals. It can be very hard to grasp, right? So who did we go to? We went to SAFE, right? And SAFE, uh, stewards of affordable housing, knew how to put those resources together to think about what is it that we need to measure from a resident services coordination so that we could tie payments to the effective performance of those services. It's one of the first pay for success models or impact investment models from philanthropy around housing in the country, right? CORS has since moved on, all right, and we have a tremendous, Camilla is here today, to, and will, I'm sure, talk to us about CORS certification and how, how that can help you in your, in your uh, offerings, right? So you can think of some, or I can think of Camilla anyway, as your personal trainer for the day, as you work to messle up on services delivery and think about what does that look like, she can coach you through that process. All right, community infrastructure. We've talked about this, right? And affordable housing has a long history of, of jumping in on workforce development, increasingly on sustainability initiatives, thinking about transit-oriented development, how to, how to work with communities to think about building critical physical infrastructure. Human resources, human services infrastructure is just as critical, and it's also physical, 
Right? So we need to think about community services overlays with affordable housing and how that can both strengthen partnerships and create that network in a community that can build. Right? Your partners are looking for su supportive community structures. Right? And they don't have them. Right? There are service systems without effective delivery mechanisms because they don't have access to housing. They don't have access to the community space. Right? They can't get to the people that you can get to. So these are two examples. These are both projects that we invested in as new market tax credits. The one on the upper right is the Blackburn building in Portland. Right? So this is a project that has um, an FQHC on site, respite care, affordable housing, um, supportive housing, all layered together. Right? It's a part of a three-building campus, which, which is a, a part of the Alliance for Health project, right? which drew over $20 million in healthcare investment to launch the project. One of those investors is here today in Dan. The second project down into the left <laughs> is the, uh, a project done by Asociación Puerto Rican San La Marcha right? in Philadelphia. It was co-developed by Jonathan here. Right, and this is a co-location of affordable housing with the set aside for supportive housing, ranging 20% to 60% AMI for about half of the units. And in that half, of, in the whole building, they have a PACE center. Right, so if you don't know PACE centers, PACE centers are like an FQHC, a federally qualified health center that specializes in senior services and can provide intensive wraparound case management services for people with uh, geriatric and aging needs and health and supports for uh, social supports in the community. Right, it's a tremendous service model. Right? Being able to put that in the building creates strength for the building. It also serves the community. It is the community infrastructure that we talk about. When you look at those maps, you think about those quarters of need, this is the type of project that they need. Right? So uh, we have Dan and we have John and they can, Jonathan, and they can be here today to be your engineers as you think about how to build the infrastructure of tomorrow. The last piece that I have is uh, reimagining housing finance. Right, so really, affordable housing finance has been fairly staid. Right? There's a lot of creative people in the room that do really creative layering and nice things. Right? But mostly, when you think about it from a national level, affordable housing finance hasn't changed too much since 1986. Right? That's when we did the big tax credit overhauls. Or you all, I wasn't doing that work then. Right? Um, but there are a lot of shifts happening in payment and finance mechanisms. Right? So the first one I think of is value-based payment. Right, so this has been shuttering through the health infrastructure for, what now, Jason, seven, seven eight years, nine years? Right, maybe longer, right? but really getting teeth with ACA and growing every year. Right, so this is the idea that, hey, we're not going to pay you for outputs anymore. I'm not going to pay you just for surgery. I'm going to pay you on whether or not your surgery actually prevented somebody from having a second heart attack. Right? So if you put in stents, that's great, but the, stent, the effect of the stent is more, in fact, more important, and I'm going to pay you for that as opposed to paying you for putting in more. Stents, okay? So this, this is shifting a lot of things, and one of the things that it's shifting is that it moves to where housing matters, right? Because if you're a healthcare provider in the past, you know, don't get me wrong, a lot of great healthcare providers that care a lot in this room, but what's the incentive? I can do surgery all day, and if you go out and you get sick and you come back again, great, I can bill for that surgery one more time. All right, so that's obviously very cynical, view of healthcare, that's not actually my view of healthcare, but that's how the system was worked and, was, and set up. Right? When that changes, then all of a sudden housing becomes not something off to the side, it's that thing that you can't do without, because now your surgery can't be successful. You can't release somebody after a cardiac surgery out to the street and hope that they're gonna get to their medication. It just doesn't work. Right? So it changes the alignment. Second piece here is impact investment. We see this really clearly with pay for success models. Right? And so I just don't want you to get too comfortable either because as much as value-based payment has impacted health, it is going to be impacting housing, right? So in, uh, we're seeing more and more communities, governments that are saying, not just I want you to provide housing, I want to see what it means. What were the health impacts? What happened to the environment? What happened to the community? How many jobs did you create? And it gets more and more stringent. So being able to understand what those impacts are is more and more important. We did a pay for sec, we did, uh, designed one of the first, co-designed one of the first pay for success initiatives focused on chronic homelessness uh, in the United States with supportive housing intervention in Massachusetts. So we were also an investor. We put in uh, part of a $2.5 million private investment that went in the project, leveraged about another $23 million of public funding from federal, state, and local resources, 
right? That project is three years in. It has housed 700 plus people, all right? It is exceeding all benchmarks. We are getting our second success payment, just got authorized at the board meeting last week, and we'll be getting our full return. We anticipate this at the end of this five-year investment, right? It's generating health savings. It's generating human service savings. It's changing people's lives. And it's something that you can do to bring people to you. Right? It's a different kind of a concrete understanding of how to get to that double bottom line. The last piece I'll talk about on this is opportunity zones. Right? So back to that, what's changed really? You know, what's changed since 1986? And there's a lot. I'm sure Mike could tell me a whole reams of things that have changed since 1986, so mea culpa, I apologize. Right? However, right, going with my, with my theory, Right? Opportunity Zones is going to be a trillion dollar marketplace. Right? They were just designated this year, and they're designated based on those corridors, the same ones that we looked at in the DC map. Right? And it would not surprise you to understand that if I overlaid that map with Opportunity Zones, every single one of them, I think, except for one, falls into those two corridors. The same places where NHP lives, the same places where affordable housing concentrates, the same places with these overlapping needs. Right? And they're looking for places that can both have high needs with low incomes, but also have the potential for growth, right? have the potential for economic investment. This is tailor-made for affordable housing. This is the newest, biggest, best opportunity to hit affordable housing. We don't know what it looks like yet. Right? You've got to figure it out. Right? But there is huge potential uh, to bring new people to the table. That includes corporate investors, that includes uh, uh, individual uh, donors that have high wealth and individual investors, right? It's a whole different set of people that are looking at this as a new tax break and a revenue stream for them, right? That you can bring to your side. All right, so when we think about redesign, the challenge is you have to talk about all these really complex things and you have to do it in like 30 seconds in a way that's much smoother than I can, right? Because system redesign is really hard. Ask New York. Right? They went under one of the most aggressive Medicaid redesigns uh, in the country. They incorporated housing in about 15 different ways. Right? Thinking about how to move resources from state capitations and savings, how to think about using services, how to move their system from a system of that fee-for-service towards a we want to generate value and we know that housing is key. Right? Jason can be your translator. He can help you understand how to, how to talk to these issues, how to break them down to a point where they can be understood by that high wealth individual that would like to work with you. All right, so I always, I'm a circular logic person, so I always go back to the beginning. If you see me speak again, I'll do it again. I apologize, I can't escape it. I know, I know that about myself. But, um, so this is a map of need, again, supportive housing need nationally. All right, and that pink, the shades of pink are just per capita rates in different states. Right? And that's my 1.2 million people out there, 1.2 million households in need of supportive housing. Remember, again, that's underneath a layer of, oh, another 8 or 12 million people that need affordable housing on top of that. Right? Those black dots here, again, are NHP's properties across the country. Now, but what do they represent, really? And I want to get these numbers, because they're impressive. Hold on. All right, so it's 8,000 units of affordable housing over 15 states. It's 40% for people living under 50% of area income. It's 97% of it has community facilities embedded. It has 100% of the projects are within three miles of a medical center, right? And roughly 5,000 people are getting resident services, right? That's a huge impact, even at a national scale. Layer onto that the rest of the members of SAFE. Then you're talking about 100, 120,000 units, right? and a disproportionate growth then of what you're gonna be able to impact, right? And now I'm gonna just pull up and those yellow sparse lights, right? Those are the LHTC, Low Income Housing Tax Credit investments that have been made, I think just since 1997 to 2016, right? So then we're talking about two and a half million units of housing in play. This doesn't feel like a mom and pop shop anymore. Right? For me, that feels like a stakeholder that has a tremendous amount of assets to bring to bear that are being underutilized and can be the backbone for public health, public safety, uh, results related to child welfare, positive youth development across the board. Right? But it needs to organize. It needs to figure out how to partner in a different way. It needs to talk about, Richard used the term paradigm shift, which is just much more elegant than reboot. 
right? The paradigm shift to think about how to move from a system of passive referral, I will build it, they will come, to a system that is fully empowered to be able to do this. Now, we have a long history in the United States of just waiting until things get really bad before we fix them. You know, we've, we've done it for two or 400 years, depending on how you want to look at our timeline, right? And so, I think we're getting there, right? The, the housing opportunity, uh, the representative said earlier that it's not the one, two, and three top issues that you see in local political or in state political issues, right? I'm here to tell you that's changing. I can't tell you the amount of elected officials I've talked to that said affordable housing is my number one issue. It is moving. It is my number one. It is my number two. It is my number three issue because it is unsustainable. And when we get to that unsustainable, the United States always has, also has a tremendous history of entrepreneurial people that come out and try new approaches and do different things. And I think we're just, we're right there on the edge, right? And it could be you that figures out those solutions, right? But I also mocked up this image, right? Because it could not be you, and don't get comfortable, right? Why not Amazon? They are spending their whole time right now trying to figure out how to develop lifelong customers, right? I had a baby about two years ago. I joined their little service. I got things I didn't even know I needed exactly when I needed them every time I needed a new set. Of, like, they just knew me better than I knew me. And I'm a first-time parent, so I don't know myself that well. But, uh, but roll with me here. Right, they, Walgreens, Best Buy, they're all trying to figure out how to get to seniors and people with seniors in their families to figure out how to help ease those transitions, provide those supports over time. Right? They are looking for your people, they are looking for your issues, and they've got the capital to do it. So why not jump in? But hey, I'm a fanciful person, I'm sure they won't. Of course, they did just donate, the Bezos folks, a couple hundred million dollars with a tag for homelessness. Right? But hey, it was probably a press issue. And they did, by the way, just in September, make their first stake investment in a housing builder, where they bought half of an A-series offering for somebody who's doing prefabricated houses, right? They got a lot of employees. Maybe they'll start with workforce housing. So, I'm gonna leave it there, and I'm gonna say that uh, despite that dire prediction, that is somewhat ridiculous uh, to be sure, Right? I think this room has the power to figure it out. I believe that you all are the brains that can, they can put this stuff together. And if I were spending pound for pound, I also remember that they just sent me $150 of hair conditioner that I don't use. Right? And I would much rather have somebody that spent their career, dedicated their mission to figuring out these issues, be the people that figure out how to do it at scale. So I'm gonna say thank you there, and I'm gonna turn it back to our folks. Wow. Thanks, Ryan, for giving us plenty of things to think about and for providing a perfect segue to the panel discussion portion of our meeting. I'd like to start by introducing our esteemed moderator, Dr. Tiffany Manuel. Dr. Manuel is Vice President of Knowledge, Impact, and Strategy for Enterprise Community Partners. Dr. Manuel is an experienced social scientist, strategist, and cross-sector leader committed to social impact. Tiffany? Well, thank you so much and good afternoon. So I hope you all are ready, because we have quite a panel of folks here to talk to y'all today. Thank you also to Ryan um, for setting the stage for this conversation. And I also want to say, just on behalf of Enterprise Community Partners, our staff, our board, congratulations to all of the Affordable Housing Trailblazers here today, Senator Collins, Representative Corbello, uh, um, Representative uh, Dubbany, and uh, Jim Hines. Uh, this is an honor and a pleasure. We recognize the incredible work that you do on behalf of affordable housing, and just want to say thank you, and we concur. You are trailblazers, and we appreciate your service. So I want to start sort of picking up where Ryan sort of left off. Ryan talked a lot about uh, those folks who are beneficiaries of both uh, housing and health, uh, the sort of intersection in which that occurs. I do a lot of work in this sort of public will building space. How do we help Americans, people who don't see that they have an, an intrinsic stake in affordable housing, how do we help them to see that they do have a stake 
in our success. So I want to point to some other statistics that I think can round out the picture. So if we think about healthcare and how it is delivered, there are 15 million people employed in the healthcare industry today. 15 million people. And we know from the American Community Survey that a good third of those folks, a good five million people, are severely housing cost burden, which means the folks who are actually delivering the care cannot afford the housing that they live in today. Think about that. It's not just the folks who are receiving care, who need right, health care, and who also need a place to live, but the folks who are delivering that right, do not have places that are stable in terms of their own housing. Think for a minute also that there are 40 million Americans who are providing what we call informal care or who are informal caregivers, which means that they're providing care for a loved one and a good 25% of them are providing almost full-time care for a relative or friend, right, so that those folks have what they need in terms of their health care. And 60% of those folks are severely cost burden, which means even those informal caregivers who are providing care to their grandmother, their cousins, their aunts, right, who are, who are frail and cannot provide their own care, also don't have the housing that they need that is affordable and available to them. If we think about just that as a, as a perspective, that really widens the conversation. We're not just talking about a small group of Americans who are struggling somehow to receive care and also afford housing. It means there are an awful lot of us, and that's just in the healthcare sector, who don't have what we need. When we think about that and how that should be helping us to communicate why this is important, it gives us certainly some conversation in terms of the intersection between this sort of health and housing. So I want to say today that our panelists, who are esteemed and innovative in every possible way, are going to help us think about what is the connective tissue between housing and health, and how do we, how do we think outside the box, I think, in the way that Ryan was talking about in his presentation. Each one of the folks on this panel are thinking every day outside of that box, and what they've come here today to do is to have a conversation about the work that they're doing and how they can inspire a whole group of folks, either in the housing and health or the connection between the two, to think about that, that as well. They think a lot about the investments, the programs, the services, the initiatives that can be helpful outside of that box. They're thinking upstream as well as downstream, like how do we avoid calamity for lots of families who find themselves in circumstances where they don't have a place to live. And they're thinking about the social determinants. I don't say the social determinants of health, I say the social determinants of opportunity. How do you get a shot at success in this country? Health is a part of that but it's a bigger landscape. So join me in welcoming an esteemed panel that's gonna help us begin to have this conversation, thinking outside the box, thinking about innovation, and thinking across sector. So, are you all up for this? All right. The so, um, so we have several folks. I'm going to take the, the time to just start by introducing our first panelist, um, uh, Joshua Bombarder. And, from, and I have to say, we, we have just met in person, but we're already in love <laughs> uh, because of the tremendous work that Kaiser does. So Dr. Bombardner is the sort of med medical director at the downtown VA Health Clinic and is consulting with Kaiser Permanente to develop a plan to end homelessness for frail seniors in Oakland. Dr. Bomberger led the San Francisco Department of Public Health, Housing and Health System Care from 1991 to 2018, uh, during which time he coordinated all medical and behavioral health services at the Health Department Supportive Housing Programs, which grew from one building in 1999 to 43 buildings, today serving almost 1,800 tenants. That's incredible. So I'd like to just start with an introductory question that allows him to start talking about some of the work that he does and why it's important for this broader conversation. Is that all right? So, what is the responsibility of the healthcare system to provide housing for people whose health is worsened by lack of housing or due to inadequate housing? Great, thanks. Um, it's wonderful to be here in Washington. Um, I feel like we're the Avengers, you know? <laughs> I'll Spider Man, I think. <laughs> you guys can choose. That's right, go with. <laughs> so I'm a family doctor. I've been taking care of homeless people in San Francisco since 1989. Um, and when I arrived at San Francisco General then uh, as an intern, it was in the midst of the AIDS crisis. And many of the people who I served 
during those years died in my hands. It was a terrible time. And we had no treatment for people with HIV in those days. There was no medications. And it was very, you know, for people who've been through a trauma, many of you who've been in the military or other traumatic events, it sort of, it concretizes your worldview when you're in the midst of that. And that set me up in a time feeling that it's just not right that people should be dying at such a young age. And that physicians would only be sort of caretakers to watch people get sick and die. As the years progressed, I shifted from taking care of people with HIV to taking care of people who are homeless. And the population of people who are both HIV infected and homeless were dying at a rate that was the same as it was in the early days of the AIDS epidemic when there wasn't, we eventually got HIV medications, but people who are homeless didn't benefit from them. And then in San Francisco, we developed all the supportive housing, as you mentioned, and the death rate among people who were HIV infected and homeless became the same rate as people who were housed because we were able to get enough housing out there so that people who were living with homelessness and HIV could benefit from antiretroviral medications. So that time period really concretized my view that as a physician, my job is to take care of the persons that didn't cross from me. And as a healthcare system, that's our role. It's not to save money. Mm -hmm. It's to take care of sick people. And the thing I don't have for my patients right now is the treatment that my patients need, which is housing. And I see it every single day. I can get someone's hemoglobin A1C down to 6.2. I can make sure they get their colonoscopy. I can get their flu shot. But then many of my patients, I roll out to the sidewalk in the rain, and I go home and know they're not going to be healthy in that setting. So what's our job as a healthcare system? Our job is to find the treatment that my patients need. And there are such great opportunities to do that today. Philanthropy can be a catalyst for getting the healthcare industry to overcome those humps that we need to make more housing. San Francisco, the voters are going to vote on something called Proposition C on November 6th. And that could bring $300 million of annual revenue to the homeless sector, which could be the operating costs so that all you folks in the affordable housing sector can build housing and know that your loan that you're using to build that housing will be paid for by the government of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. so the, and then philanthropy can come along to initiate new ways of building. We can get some modular housing building. We can do all sorts of great things. Kaiser has led the way in Portland, and Dan can speak about that much more intimately than I can to create an opportunity to be the catalyst for more supportive housing so that my patients don't have to suffer and die in a way that we really haven't seen except in these horrible scourges of our lives like, like HIV. Mm -hmm. So I think it is the responsibility of the healthcare system to do the right thing, and that right thing is make more housing. Dr. Baumberger, thank you so much for that. Um, so I'm gonna turn my attention a little bit to Maria Torres Springer. Thank you for joining us, welcome. So I'm gonna say a little bit about her background. Uh, as commissioner of the nation's largest municipal housing agency, Maria leads the charge to implement uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio's Housing New York, a five borough, 10 year plan, a bold initiative to create or preserve 200,000 affordable homes and apartments in diverse thriving neighborhoods. She's demonstrated a record of expanding economic opportunity and building relationships between community, government, and private businesses to support neighborhood revitalization projects throughout New York City. She previously served as the president of New York City Economic Development Corporation. Uh, again, welcome. Thank you very much. So, so this is a question after my own heart. <laughs> so you have been, uh, um, uh, as part of your role, conducting a longitudinal study to evaluate the impact of moving newly constructed affordable housing uh, on the well-being of low-income sort of working households. Can you share a little bit about what you're learning from that body of work in terms of health impacts of affordable housing and how that's begun to influence the strategy that you all have uh, in your agency? Of course. Uh, thanks, Tiffany. Good evening, everyone. First, um, it's terrific to be here tonight to uh, participate in this discussion. Um, as mentioned, and I've been in this role for a couple of years as a housing commissioner for New York City, but I've spent most of my time 
in government um, focused on economic development. And if there's one thing that I have reflected on and see in the day-to-day -day work in New York City, a city that faces a lot of the same pressures as so many other um, municipalities in the country, but probably those pressures on steroids, just given the, um, given the scale of um, both the aspiration and the challenges in New York City, is that there has always likely been, but continues to be an extraordinary need to connect the dots. And of course today, the discussion is about health and housing. Um, but it has been and needs to continue to be connecting the dots between housing and economic development, housing and training, housing and sustainability. Because people, of course, and everyone here who's been a practitioner who's worked on um, improving the lives of your community's residents, you know that people don't experience just one issue. It's not just the pressures on housing. It's the, they experience pressures on so many different levels. And so the opportunity to think about what it means to change the paradigm, to create new tools, to rely on research, and I'll get to your question, I promise, in just one second, um, has to be um, not just the future of the affordable housing industry or the future of healthcare, but I think the future of urbanists and policymakers and practitioners and private sector partners as we together uh, try to tackle um, the, the myriad issues in our communities. And so in New York, um, unprecedented success um, in terms of population growth and jobs, but we're at a point in time where the pressures for struggling families are enormous and that manifests itself like it does in many other places in extraordinarily high percentages of families who are rent burdened in an extremely low vacancy rate, too many people living below the poverty line, and 60,000 people, many of whom are working families, many of whom are children, who sleep in our shelters across the five boroughs. And so the stakes are really high. Um, we are, of course, we have a pretty, the very, very mature affordable housing uh, ecosystem um, in New York City. And of the many different tools that we've created and innovated over time, one of the things that I think doesn't get talked about a lot, and so it's great to have the opportunity to discuss here, is the work that we've done to fully understand in the most rigorous way, we think, what exactly has been the impact of affordable housing to the people of our city. And so we are in year 10 um, of a longitudinal study, randomized controlled trial. We've been following, we started with 16,000 partic baseline participants. We followed 3,000 households, th or, sorry, 3,000 households over the course of the last 10 years, households that um, have um, uh, been able to get our affordable housing and those who haven't, and those findings are staggering. In many ways, it's intuitive. They, of course, have um, better housing outcomes, less rent burden, better quality housing, better financial outcomes, more money in their pockets, um, better attachment to health insurance. Um, but the health outcomes are particularly staggering. Um, much lower um, instances of diabetes, of asthma, um, uh, less um, incidence of, of having a secondhand smoker in the household, less um, incidences of depression. And while intuitive, it's really the type of data that allowed, has allowed us to say we have to double down on what we know works. And so the 10-year, 200,000 um, housing plan that we have, we actually just expanded last fall, so it's now a 300,000 um, unit plan by 2026. A lot of that is in support of housing, and so I'm glad there was such a terrific um, discussion earlier about the power and the potential of supportive housing, a very a, a proven model that has us on the government side um, really working with so many different partners to braid all of the different funding sources, whether it's capital for the project, of course, tax credits, the service dollars, that rental assistance that is needed that today in New York City um, is city funded. And we've built thousands of those over the course of the last few years and will continue. 
Um, it also has meant partnering, we hope in very innovative ways, with our public hospital system, not just building on underutilized land in all of the campuses given the downsizing of certain institutions, but finding ways to co-locate services so that we're not just building affordable housing, but we're providing access to health care to our tenants, creating real community assets, and really looking for those win-wins. So I say all of that because um, the, the work that we were doing in New York City, we're, we're quite proud of, but given the very staggering statistics that I mentioned earlier, it's not enough. And in order to solve the problems on not just a local level, but in order for the systems, whether it's affordable housing or the healthcare system, or you name the system, for, for there to be a step change in the way we operate so that we tackle the issues um, for enduring um, success, it's, I think, precisely these types of conversations that are going to be um, necessary in order to achieve those goals. Thank you so much for that. I, I loved hearing that. I think you're right, the stakes are very high. You're right, it's not enough, but that's a part of the conversation, is how can we scale the fantastic work that you all are doing in New York and some of the work of our panelists as well. So I want to turn our attention to our next uh, uh, pa panelist here, uh, Stephen Brown, who is the Director of Preventative Emergency Medicine at the University of Illinois Hospital. Uh, so Stephen is a faculty member uh, uh, and Director of, of Emergency Medicine at University of Illinois. Uh, he came to the department in 2011 to establish a program to identify and manage healthcare super utilizers. He is a program director for Better Health Through Housing, a demonstration pilot that raises awareness for the need to recognize homelessness as a dangerous social condition and to scale the nationally validated Housing First model, which transitions patients who are chronically homeless into permanent supportive housing. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. So an initial question for you is just why would a hospital uh, pay for housing and what pitch, I love this, what, what pitch would you make to internal decision makers who, 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 who want to think about what that could look like for their organizations and institutions? Sure, thank you, Tiffany. Um, thank you for um, honoring me, uh, allowing me to speak here tonight. Um, it's such an exciting conversation to share the stage with so many other people that have such a specialization, um, I think, the one thing they have to bring to this work is um, we can fix this. I've been described as pathologically positive and I think, uh, I believe my panelists share the same characteristic, uh, I would hope. Um, and it's the great work that's being done in each one of these and as we begin to understand each other's worlds and how those, the intersectionality of those things is beginning to make an impact. Um, I've been in the work now for two years, two and a half years, and I've seen uh, the conversation evolve pretty quickly so I'm very encouraged by that. So I run a program called Better Health or Housing, and we uh, house the chronically homeless that we identify in our emergency department. We're located about a mile and a half west of our downtown, or the loop we call it in Chicago, um, in the Illinois Medical District, so it's a very high concentration of beds. Um, and uh, through that program, we've now housed over 42 chronically homeless individuals out of our emergency department. And Part of why we decided to frame this as a demonstration pilot and not a randomized control trial is we didn't really know what we were doing. Um, and, you know, and I can't say we really had some great ideas about why we were gonna do it in the first place. We, we kind of backed our way into it. We're a public institution with a health equity mission. Um, everyone in, uh, b there were some stipulations in the Affordable Care Act that said that we needed to uh, think about population health, so managing the health of a community, not the individuals that come through our doors. Um, and um, that we were a state institution that we felt that we could be more proactive in guiding a lot of the policy issues around healthcare delivery to the Medicaid patients in the state of Illinois. And so those very kind of nebulous things that we uh, described, we decided to invest. Um, the program has been running since 2015. We've housed about 27. I'm sorry, uh, 42 as I mentioned. Um, and the thing we get all the time is why would a hospital pay for housing? Um, and the answer is we're learning that it's a very important thing that we need to do. Um, it gave us the opportunity through this demonstration pilot to now understand homelessness is a dangerous health condition. So why is it dangerous? Well, the average life expectancy for a chronically homeless individual. And a chronically homeless individual, somebody who's been continually homeless for over a year or has had four episodes in the last three years, um, 
is that life expectancy is 27 years less than the average American. Um, we've also described, uh, we've been able to describe incredible disease burden. So um, we, we had a 35% mortality rate in the first 26 that we housed. So almost every one out of three passed. And uh, also 66% uh, of the s uh, six females, or two thirds of the females we housed had passed away too. But we also saw these incredible rates of chronic disease and often, often multiple chronic disease. Um, we saw 38% of um, mental illness, just general mental illness. 38% of that was serious mental illness. 50% um, had asthma. Um, I think it was like 60% had um, some form of uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, we also discovered that 42% had a form of cancer and a fifth of the cohort had metastatic cancer, which was one of the uh, most, was the, we had I think three of the individuals that passed were had some form of metastatic cancer. So we're now describing this as a dangerous health condition. Um, we also found that we weren't doing a very job of finding these individuals. Um, we've now found that about 4,500 individuals have passed through our doors since 2010. That's kind of astounding to us because we thought we had 48 or 50 individuals. Um, and then we also found that the cost and utilization to these individuals was extraordinary. Um, I just completed a data run of, uh, that I used to have, a, I used to be a systems engineer prior to being a social worker in the ER, so have some access to data. And I looked at it and we had, um, I looked at 1,200 individuals in our healthcare system, about a third of them were in the, t the fourth quartile, so the most expensive patients in our system. And these are only patients within my system. So, um, they had healthcare costs that ran anywhere from two and a half times to 160 times the average patient cost in our system. And this is, again, just within our systems. I don't have claims data in the state of Illinois. So extraordinarily expensive. And then the other thing we've learned is that our retention rate wasn't as good as other housing first programs. You, you expect 80 to 90% retention after two years. Ours was 54%. And that we believe that's because we're ED based and so many of the individuals were unsheltered individuals that were coming through our doors. Um, and because of that, uh, just a higher level of acuity, people that have really taken the, the years on the street have taken a severe toll on their lives. Um, but the other thing we found was that there's a mismatch between the type of housing and supports that we need for these individuals and the characteristics of these individuals. So somebody with severe mental illness substance abuse issue and a couple of chronic diseases probably needs to be in a project-based, cluster-based housing with assertive community treatment embedded in it, very high level of support. Um, and now, because of that, we're having conversations in the city of uh, Chicago with the Corporation of Supportive Housing at the table is how do we align these things? So, um, you know, I, uh, the question is, we, we do this to answer questions directly is because it's part of our health equity mission, but we think we're driving a lot of policy discussions in this. And our hospital continues to fund this because we're learning so much out of this too. We're about to start publishing real data, real research on this too. We're starting with a methods paper. We'll probably uh, do a randomized control trial next year. Um, but um, that's a long way to answer your very brief question. So. <laughs> no, that was fantastic. That's right, well, thank you so much. I'm going to turn now to Daniel Field, um, who is Executive Director of Community Health and External Affairs at Kaiser Permanente uh, Northwest. Um, so uh, Dan is accountable for oversight of community programs that com comprises uh, Kaiser Permanente's uh, Northwest community benefits spending of approximately $150 million annually. And he also leads uh, uh, KPNW's government relations, public relations, and corporate communications teams, which work very closely with community business and elected uh, stakeholders to support the mission and enhance and protect Kaiser Permanente's reputation. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. So an initial question for you, why would an insurer, right? Uh, invest in housing and what kinds of investments specifically are well suited for an insurer? Yeah, thank you for that question. And uh, one of the things about Kaiser Permanente, some of you know we're the largest fully integrated nonprofit health system in the country. So we are an insurer and a payer, but we're integrated with a physician group and a hospital a, a, a delivery system as well. And so we're in a unique position 
to look at the total uh, population of our membership and look at their total health and consider all of their needs, medical and non-medical needs. We're also primarily uh, a prepaid system, so that allows us to not necessarily um, bet the farm on a fee-for-service system that Ryan talked about, and again, in a unique position uh, to think about the total needs of our members. Like a lot of health system, we've implement, uh, systems, we've implemented a social needs inventory tool that is embedded in our electronic medical record system. So the traditional EMR captures sort of A to Z of somebody's medical situation. Um, and this new social needs inventory tool, which we call the YCLS, your current life situation, is basically a very simple interview form that somebody can complete on their own or they can complete with the assistance of a, a medical assistant or a patient navigators. And I want to just give you a couple snapshots of data that just sort of reconfirm some of the things you heard from Ryan and others on our panel. Um, and these, these numbers are from different uh, points in time, so they don't be alarmed if they don't uh, overlap perfectly. Uh, we took a sample of 51,000 YCLS respondents, and we asked, how many of you have one or more of the following social determinants, and we listed food, housing, et cetera. Um, 9,000 of the 51,000 reported that they had one or more. So that's almost 20% of our patients said that they had a social non-medical need that was impacting their health. So if you think about Josh being a frontline physician, uh, bringing all of his training and expertise and all the resources of a large health system to bear on a patient, and yet one out of five, or in Josh's case, many more than that, he's dealing with a very uh, needy, high-risk, vulnerable population. But imagine every other, or every third, or even every fifth patient walking out the door, and no matter what you do for them, Josh, you know you have not solved the one thing or the two things that will most effectively address their health situation. And that's across all of our membership, not just low-income membership. So within that, we have the big three, food, transportation, and housing. We had a cohort of about 39,000 uh, patients, and we said, in the past three months, how many of you have experienced difficulty with that same list? Um, 3,900, number one answer was 3,900, or exactly 10% said food insecurity at some point during the last three months. Right behind that at 3,500, right around 9% uh, said housing. At some point, we've had some level of housing insecurity. So we looked at a cohort of uh, 12,000 uh, respondents who said that they had had a challenge uh, with their housing. And we asked them to dig down a bit deeper. The number one response, just about half, 6,000, said the number one housing problem was paying for rent or utilities. That's, that's probably predictable. Um, uh, 2,400 said that they, they were struggling to find permanent housing. So maybe they were on the cusp of eviction, couch surfing, sleeping in their car, or something else. And then the third, for people experiencing housing challenges, the third were living conditions or safety, and that was about 2,000. So if you roll that up, plus a lot of others, you get to that, that 12,000 uh, people who said they were experiencing. So when you say, why would an insurer make that investment? Clearly, if we're committed to the total health of our members, we can no longer uh, say, we'll meet your medical needs and we'll refer you to others to meet your social needs. So we have made some investments into housing strategy. And just briefly, I'll tell you, we started with the Blackburn project that, that Ryan highlighted. That was a permanent supportive housing project uh, with some respite care mixed in and some transitional housing. But as we look across the whole spectrum of housing strategies, what's What's not well known is that Blackburn building actually started as a conversation in Portland uh, from one of our health system CEOs, uh, a conversation about workforce housing. So like most major urban centers, we've got a lot of uh, uh, in, um, low and middle income workers working in the health system who are commuting an hour into the academic medical center that's in downtown Atlanta, downtown Denver, downtown Portland, Seattle, et cetera. So we started there and we ended up with a, a permanent supportive housing model. But I think you'll see health systems going back. In fact, some in Cincinnati have gone back to workforce housing strategies. The other investment we've made, and I'll close on this, uh, is in services. So not on rent support, not on uh, capital construction, but in uh, supportive housing services. And most recently, in our Portland region, we've invested with seven different community organizations, Catholic Charities, Urban League, Native American, uh, across the board, seven different organizations, and we said, we're gonna fund 
uh, traditional health workers, those are promotoras, uh, or other uh, supportive housing workers. And we're gonna fund whatever model you think is gonna work in your community to keep people housed. So if you have people with mental illness and they need some of that support to stay housed day after day, week after week, month after month, a lot like your friend Barry, who was in a really good spot to compare to where he was, but periodically, if I understood you correctly, periodically he needed some professional support to keep him housed at that moment in time. So we're investing in those services as well and hoping that those models can then be replicated and funded by other partners in the, in the health system. Fantastic, thank you so much for being both a sort of regional and national leader in the space and working so closely with community-based organizations to help them think about what the needs of those communities are. Fantastic. I'm gonna turn now to Jason Halgerson, who um, I love the, I love this, was not only just um, a medical director for the state of New York and a consultant, but a social change agent. How about that? <laughs> so um, you have um, certainly uh, begun your own consulting uh, after being the medical director for the state of New York, uh, really working with companies, providers, payers, and governments to sort of move on the value of healthcare. Um, you advise all kinds of uh, external folks, private equity firms and venture capital funds to, to think about the commitment to value-based healthcare as well as working to, as an advisor to McKinsey and Company. Um, and you certainly say prior to your move to the private sector, you were sort of a nationally recognized leader and that led you to some of the activities that you're now doing in the private sector. Um, so welcome to the panel. So for you, would love to have you think just back a little bit about your time uh, as Medicaid uh, director, uh, but also moving that forward. You said that you know Medicaid is already in the business of housing, uh, whether they know it or not, right? Mm -hmm. And so the question for you would be, how would you direct Medicaid and other government spending uh, or folks who are providing resources to be more efficient in how those resources are delivered and to really think intentionally about how they enter this housing space? Sure, so um, we actually had an uh, interesting discussion with the federal government back when we were developing what eventually became the uh, delivery system reform incentive payment program known as DISHRIP, which was an uh, opportunity, and it's still going on in New York, to invest $8 billion into the healthcare system in New York State to try to achieve greater efficiencies, lower costs, improve outcomes for the Medicaid population. But as part of that, and by the time we got to that, uh, that discussion with the federal government, we had come to fully appreciate the importance that housing played um, in trying to really uh, change the tra trajectory of lives, uh, not just to lower costs, but actually to improve the human condition. Um, but we also believe that uh, the economics uh, were in our favor, where that ultimately if we could connect housing and services for particularly for high needs Medicaid members, we could actually uh, lower healthcare costs uh, and in essence prove, pay for uh, much of that housing intervention. And so we were trying to convince the federal government, I remember a federal official saying, uh, but Jason, Medicaid isn't in the housing business. And, uh, and my response was, yes, we are. And we have been since the, or, since the program began in 1965 because a mandatory benefit in the Medicaid package is a nursing home. And there is nothing, I mean, if, if a nursing home is a 24-hour facility and people live there, um, and, and for a long, long time, uh, people lived there for many, many years, um, and, uh, and it's always been, and a lot of the services, those housing services that we pay for in long-term care are a major cost category in the program. Uh, but we also pay in, in, indirectly for housing mm -hmm. um, uh, in the healthcare system uh, and Medicaid in particular. We pay for individuals who can't be safely discharged. Uh, because they have nowhere to go. Uh, and states have policies, localities have policies that you can't discharge someone to a shelter. Uh, so what happens is those individuals stay in the hospital for extended periods of time, uh, which is one of the most expensive forms of housing one could ever imagine. Um, so I think no question is that uh, the Medicaid program is in the housing business whether it wants to be, uh, wonder, whether it wants to be there or not. And so I think that the, 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 the opportunity we have, and it was sort of described earlier, is that uh, healthcare is changing. Uh, and it's changing because um, the people who purchase healthcare services, whether that's the government or commercial insurers or large employers or individuals, uh, are starting to say, you know what? Uh, we're not gonna tolerate ever rising growth in costs and not measurable improvements in outcomes. Um, and, uh, and we're gonna look for ways to change that. And what is the big, I think, underlying change in the healthcare infrastructure that's happening is this move to value-based payment. 
It's a fundamental change in the economic incentives. It's drawing providers together. Uh, and when I say provider, I don't just mean a bunch of healthcare providers, your doctors and your hospitals and your nursing homes, but a much broader array of stakeholders, community-based organizations, local governments, um, uh, your neighborhood uh, a, a soup kitchen, organizations coming together who see the holistic needs of the people that they serve and beginning to think what, about what they can do together uh, to better meet the needs of those communities. I think it's going to open the door, and it's already opening the door, and, and, and Kaiser Permanente is a great example of what we hope this system will look like in the future, which is more and more providers aligning themselves and accepting reimbursement that actually creates a real incentive for them to invest in things like housing, things that will prevent health care costs in the future, things that will change the trajectory of lives and, and lower costs at the same time. And I am very bullish that uh, while we're still working these things through, that, that more and more states will begin to embrace this vision, more and more payers, uh, insurers, and providers who now will look more like insurers in the sense that they will uh, be taking on financial risk. They will be seeing their payments much like Kaiser receives them in these sort of prepaid manner. Uh, that will become the norm in American healthcare. And as a result of that, there'll be some great opportunities. But I would say is, and this is sort of a challenge to everyone in the room, these are not gonna be the your typical customers uh, for supportive or affordable housing. Your typical customer, in the sense of who actually pays the bills for those types of services, has been government. And government's view is very much as a public good. Uh, if we're going to get these organizations, these private organizations, to get engaged in it, we're going to have to think about offering them housing solutions in different ways. Uh, because they're going to be looking for ways that they can invest cost effectively, uh, and they're at risk. They're going to be looking at the need to show improved performance. They're going to need to manage total cost of care. And so housing is going to have to respond to that and offer new innovative models for them to participate. But I am very bullish, uh, as our uh, future speaker uh, talked, that we will will demonstrate that American entrepreneurialism and, and solve this chronic uh, problem that we have around uh, the, uh, homelessness and uh, inadequate housing, uh, and particularly we'll do it with a real focus on uh, those with complex medical needs. Thank you, Jason. That was fantastic. Loved reframing the conversation um, that we are already in the housing business and that uh, the sort of move to value-based care allows us to think about how the incentive structure Right, really incentivizes us to, to really intentionally be in that space. So I'd love to move to Dr. Camilla Wood. Welcome. Uh, so Dr. Camilla Wood, in her role at um, the Stewards of Affordable Housing for the Future, uh, serves as program and policy expert on the intersection of health and housing by using housing as a platform to create health equity and improve outcomes for safe residents. She facilitates the kinds of partnerships with the health sector and also informs policymakers on critical issues at that intersection of health and housing. Prior to joining SAFE, she was appointed as special advisor and White House fellow to Secretary Anthony Fox at the U.S. Department of Transportation. So I'd love from the vantage point of an affordable housing uh, provider network, um, uh, at the, at the, a network of affordable housing providers, I'd love to ask you um, what's needed, what would you say in the, in the healthcare space to, for uh, those folks to play a larger role in the production, creation, uh, preservation of affordable housing as an issue? Absolutely, and it's such an honor and privilege to be here. I think it's so fun to be on a panel where there's two other physicians. Um, it's always great to kind of bring that voice to the table. Um, where we're all different specialties and so carry very different lenses in how we look at this work. I'm really excited to kind of bring that lens through the work that I'm doing at SAFE and then how we're thinking holistically about all of this. I also really appreciate it, Ryan's presentation because housing is by far the most critical social determinant of health. And SAFE really harnesses that and understands that in the work that we're doing. So we are a national collaborative of 13 nonprofit affordable housing developers. NHP Foundation is one of our many fantastic members. And through our work, we really try to think about housing in a way that can really improve the lives of the residents that we're serving. And we do that through a variety of initiatives, specifically around resident services, thinking about innovative collaborations that we can do to really foster improved outcomes. I say all that knowing, though, that our number one problem is we don't have enough affordable housing in general. 
So as a pediatrician, you know, I heard Josh, we talk about, you know, hospital and healthcare's ability to take care of sick people, and it's also to prevent illness and sickness. And as a pediatrician, my role is to really prevent that three-month-old infant that I see for a well child visit from becoming the 65-year-old veteran who's disabled with bipolar and schizophrenia that has no coordination of care. And really, if I could do my job really well, I would save everybody a whole bunch of money. The STEN example is great. I want to prevent patients from even needing the stints. But the system and the structures aren't really there to support that. And not having that affordable, quality affordable, healthy home is such a critical element. So SAFE has been really thinking about how we can engage in the conversation, not, from a, not just from a services perspective, which is really important, but thinking about how do we increase affordable housing supply. And again, our uh, members and our residents and the, the patients that I serve are often not those high super utilizers, so it's really hard to sometimes engage in conversation with healthcare stakeholders. So if we think about the supply issue for people across the life course, so from preconception to seniors, everybody needs more affordable housing options. And so we're thinking about engaging with healthcare industries and systems to think about who needs to be at the table to really invest additional capital to diversify equity so that we can actually build more housing supply. Um, we've understood in our work that there's a lot of challenges and opportunities in working with both insurers and health systems. And sometimes it's just about having the right person at the table. So working with community benefits is one lever, but also getting the CEO, the CFO, the decision makers around the financial decisions of a hospital and institution is really, really critical. So we're trying to figure out how to tap into that and understanding that the greatest prescription that I can write is really for someone to have that affordable, stable home that really promotes economic opportunity and mobility. And I really find from a public health lens and really also leveraging health equity lenses around that, that is by far the most critical element that we can work on in addition to understanding the role that support services um, and uh, services in which housing can play in improving health. Dr. Wood, thank you so much for that. That was fantastic. Um, and being a, a fantastic champion for a wide range of, of decision makers being thoughtful in this conversation. So last but not least, Jonathan Rose. Um, so Jonathan Rose is a real estate developer, urban planner, and author extraordinaire. Um, Jonathan Rose's business and public policy and not-for-profit work really focuses on uh, providing more environmentally, socially, and economically responsible, not just affordable homes, but worlds. How about that? Um, in 1989, uh, Mr. Rose founded Jonathan Rose Companies, a multidisciplinary real estate development, planning, consulting, and investment firm. The firm has completed $2.3 billion or billion dollars in transformational work in close collaboration with cities and not-for-profits around the country. Mr. Rose is a thought leader in a wide range of urban issues on the development of communities of opportunity. He's received MIT's Visionary Leadership Award, the Urban Land Institute's Global Award for Excellence, and many other awards for his work. Mr. Rose is also a recognized author, most recently, The Well-Tempered City. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you. So as an owner, developer, um, how would you sort of make use of the current housing stock to really help um, uh, high utilizer populations get the services and resources they need. Got it. Okay. So I'm going to talk about how all these wonderful ideas, the rubber meets the road in the building, and I'm going to expand it from high user, utilizer populations to a broad range of populations because we actually deal from families that are formerly homeless all the way to middle income in, in, our, in our projects. So we think there's both a, what I call a hardware and a software solution on the physical society, side. So, and just to frame it, uh, our company currently owns 15,000 units all around the United States. And they are a mixture of buildings that we build ourselves from scratch and uh, to a much dar larger degree buildings that we are acquiring through acquisition funds, preserving their affordability, making green, and then uh, bringing these benefits to. We also deeply believe that there is an intersection on the health side. So obviously, housing is a stable platform. You've all described how important that is. Um, we think that there's both a service side, but there's also an environmental side. And that um, our instinct is, and we hope to, we're just beginning a study, we hope to prove out that there's a um, co-priming effect between environmental toxins, between uh, I kind of call the mental health toxins or toxic stress 
and all the other factors that are affecting low-income populations. So we think the greenness, uh, we use the Enterprise Green Community Guideline, particularly the non-toxic part of, of uh, indoor air quality, et cetera, is really important. And we know from the Flint case, the, uh, the quality of the water is really important. And we know from other studies that on the affordable side, that on the green side, that reducing energy costs for our residents, if we can save them 30, 50, 80 dollars a month in utility bills for a family that's earning 15,000, 18, 28,000 dollars a year, 32,000 dollars a year, that's a huge benefit in adding economic resilience. Okay. In every project, we are building a health exam room and we are partnering with a local health care agency. And as you've all described it, not only is housing cheaper for you, a, a, a part of your prescription, but actually if you can see residents on our site versus in your hospital emergency rooms, that's a lot less expensive for you. So we can actually deliver populations at volumes that make it worth coming to on site. And as you've all noted, most of your um, my residents are being uh, covered by Medicaid and Medicare, and to the extent that some of them aren't, it's worth picking them up in, in a visit because you're saving on the hospital emergency room side. Uh, people mentioned uh, the issue of uh, food, and we know that our low-income populations often are missing uh, a, a week of meals a month. So not only do we have community gardens, but community gardens are not a year-round solution. So we partner with local food banks, food shares in uh, Michigan. We're partnering with something called a mobile grocery, which brings very low cost or free food to our residents, healthy food and vegetables, vegetables and fruits particularly, uh, which is really essential. And we know that it's, um, it's not only determinative of health, it's obviously key for uh, young children's uh, development. So uh, housing is an important prescription and We've already, and we know that medicine and actually medical compliance is an important part of prescription, but we know that healthy food is part of prescription. The next part is exercise. So all of our projects not only have exercise rooms, but more importantly, we're building a social, um, socialization around exercise. For example, walking clubs, competition uh, for seniors, chair yoga. I, I by the way, uh, mocked the chair yoga and said, and, and was told, no, it's, it's, it's for safety, that it's actually very important that seniors who try and do yoga not in chairs, if they're particularly inflexible and they start, it's, um, that it's a higher risk of accidents. At any rate, so we're doing all, we're bringing all kinds of programs uh, on, the, on, on the exercise part. We know that uh, low-income people often, particularly when they're unsafe neighborhoods, become socially isolated, and that leads also to a lack of cognitive development in children and how important socialization is. So safety, it turns out, to be hugely an important social determinant of health. And, uh, we, uh, and in very low-income communities, we've even come to building fences and uh, spending a lot more on security you know, as the old liberal in me thinks that we should all be open, but what I've realized is we have watched our communities blossom when we have made them much safer. Um, and then that, within that blossoming, you begin to get these socialization, which is really important. Uh, and the last thing is we know, particularly from the incredible work that Kaiser did uh, about the impact of adverse childhood experiences on, on children's development, and I actually believe that is one of the key causes of multi-generational poverty. Um, and if we're going to overcome it, so safety begins is very important. Then what happens, uh, so we know that domestic violence is an adverse childhood experience. And typically in affordable housing, what you do with domestic violence is you evict the family, and that's a second adverse. So we just doubled the kid's life of chance of lifetime condemnation. So we in the industry are moving much more towards trauma-informed property management, trying to understand these as solutions. I could go on and on, but the point is to try and bring all these together. The hardware investments, a community room, computer for after school education, health exam room, social service consulting room, a few other things actually are not that expensive and we're able to build them easily into our renovation budgets. The cost is in we need to hire one resident service coordinator. And they, everything else I described is provided by third parties that we then have to coordinate with. The problem is that that resident service coordinator, if it's an MSW, 
uh, in a high cost area and you're giving benefits is probably $90,000, $100,000 all in, maybe just a little bit less. The typical low income housing tax credit project in the United States is 60 units and has a net cash flow of about $28,000 to $32,000 a year can't afford such a person. Even in the larger project-based Section 8s, interestingly, HUD will not allow an RSC in a Section 8 budget. Um, so I actually believe that if you want to look at the, re at the highest leverage points where we can intersect, it's three places. It's number one, educating and, and, and growing what is that hardware physical infrastructure that allows housing truly to be the prescription that you want. Number two, developing the, the funding screen for the resident service coordinator. My sense is if the healthcare system could pay for that one position, it would be huge payback for you. Um, and then number three is how do we, is collecting the data to prove the case so we can take this to scale. I'd like to offer just one more question to our panelists, just in a just popcorn way, and you can answer it at will as you think about it. But you know, for this audience, you know, thinking about the one thing, some people, you know, we often talk about what's the one thing that if you could say this thing, if we could just get one thing right, <laughs> the thousand things we should do in terms of what we could do at the intersection of health and housing. But if there was one thing that we could just, if we got that right, it would really matter. Uh, for all the folks that we serve, what would that be? What would that look like? And a little bit about your aspiration around that. So um, any, it doesn't matter who starts, but would love to hear your thoughts about that. The one thing. Well, I mean, not to go on the order again, but when I, I worked for President Obama at the end of his first term, and uh, during that time he gave a speech to the veterans, uh, uh, the VA um, folks, and he said, no one who's ever worn a military uniform should spend a night in the streets. I'll repeat that. He said, no one who's ever worn a military uniform should spend a night on the streets. And over the last 10 years, we've been able to develop a funding stream through a bipartisan working group so that the number of communities around the country where veterans do not spend a night in the streets is now over 70. What would happen if we decided as a country that no one over the age of 55 should spend a night in the streets? What would that be like? And how much would it cost? Could we find a funding stream in today's environment through either bond measures, combination of bond measures or fees or taxes or philanthropy, where we had leadership in this country where we said that no one over the age of 55, just to think about a seven-year-old spending on the streets makes me crazy. So I, I think we're at this time where we've learned enough about how to do supportive housing. We've learned about financing. We know we have LIHTC system is working sometimes. Um, where we can build all these pieces together. Where I really believe that you know, if, if Jason had the chance to not have to spend his Medicaid dollars on housing, but could spend it on resident service coordinators and do what we do in the healthcare, which is more in the center of what we do, and we had other streams so that we could build enough housing so that no one over the age of 55 spends a night on the streets. I'm gonna keep saying that. So it just becomes what we do. So that's my big, bold idea that I'd love to leave inside the Beltway to go back to San Francisco thinking that we can achieve that in the next five to 10 years so no one age of, over the age of 55 spends night on the streets. Right. I'm struck by the idea of collective impact, um, what the Oregon folks have been doing. Um, and I got a chance to talk to Peter Rep, who is the uh, now retired CEO of Oregon Health Sciences University. And he was coaching me on some of the things we're doing. And he said, well, you know, out here in the Northwest, we got a little bit more collective DNA. Um, and I can't underestimate, that's a really important piece. We're already starting this conversation here. But to give you an example, so Corporation Supportive Housing is helping us with what we call flexible housing subsidy pools, something we're modeling off of what's going on in LA County. And in LA County now, they're able to build about 2,000 units because people are contributing to this fund. It's essentially braiding all the funding available for folks that have homelessness into a common fund. Now, if we do that in the city of Chicago, and it's uh, the third party administrator has been announced and they're just spooling up and everything, but if we can imagine every hospital investing in that, and there's 35 hospitals in the region, and we know there's about 2,500 chronically homeless individuals, boom. there's, yeah, boom, right. Um, it's the right size. Yeah, it's the right size. Um, if we can get everybody to contribute as they can, you know, some of our safety net hospitals. We'd have to do this on a sliding scale. But the potential exists within this flexible housing pool if every hospital contributed to house every chronically homeless individual in the region. 
so collective impact. Fantastic, yeah. uh, somewhat related to uh, what's just been discussed, I think in the affordable housing industry, we need to build a much bigger tent. It has seen such incredible successes over the course of the last um, many decades, but given the crisis in this country, and I think everyone here of course knows it's not just an urban issue, it's certainly um, not just a blue state issue, it is a completely bipartisan issue, it has spared no place in this country and no state in this country can someone making the federal minimum wage, working full time, afford a one bedroom apartment at fair market rent. Um, it's just, um, it is reason for many to be disheartened, but I think, to borrow your term, it's also a reason for all of us to be both pathologically positive about it and to think about what it means to break down the barriers, both barriers that exist for one in government because funding sources are so siloed and institutional agendas are siloed, um, the barriers that exist within sectors because everyone speaks a different language and is uh, driven by different metrics, um, and for everyone to care more at all levels of government and um, across different sectors to really get to a point where we're not just solving on an ad hoc basis or in a uh, project specific basis, connecting all those dots and doing the types of things that not just provide people with housing but really improve their lives, um, but we're doing it in a way that is um, that uplifts entire communities and really thinks about what that means not just for the person but for the neighborhood and ultimately for the larger economy. And so the, the, the day when there are presidential debates and or polls and or conversations where people name what their number one issue is or their number two issue is and it's always about housing, um, that's when the conversation will, I think, really start shifting and we're seeing some signs of that, but that then quickly has to lead both to action on a national level and then the types of innovation that everyone here is extraordinarily capable of on a local level to really see um, enduring change. You asked us about our aspirations. That's pretty aspirational, thinking of a presidential debate about housing. Um, <laughs> I mean, just once. The, just the once. word housing being mentioned once would be, <laughs> it's, that's It's going to happen, right? you know, maybe not soon. But um, my, my one piece of encouragement would be don't get stuck on the money. Mm. Don't get stuck on the money. I know it's about money, and I know that's why a lot of us are, are focused on this, is how do we allocate the resources appropriately, and how do we tap into resources and other systems. But I want to build on what Jonathan said about some of the ways you're constructing your buildings, because I think there's a lot of promise there. You know, the reality is that hospitals and medical clinics are a terrible place to get health care, and a terrible place to provide health care. They're expensive to build and operate. Uh, they can be difficult to get to, uh, inconvenient for most of us. They're built on an old assembly line production model that's completely outdated today. And I guarantee that when Amazon and Berkshire Hathaway and that innovative partnership, uh, as they come together that Atul Gawande is leading, I guarantee their first move is not going to be to build a hospital. They're going to be doing some other things that are very innovative and may align, Jonathan, with the projects that you talked about. We as a system at Kaiser Permanente and many others are making massive investments in innovative technologies, mobile health, telehealth, digital health, home and work-based clinics. I was sharing with somebody that Intel, a major group of ours, uh, they said, you know, we want you to put a little telepresence clinic at our job site. Uh, that's an easy thing to do if the alternative is to build a clinic next door or down the road. A telepresence room works really well. And if we can do that at Intel, why can't we do that in your projects? Think about housing uh, that is purpose-built for home monitoring. You know, if people have a chronic uh, heart disease, an easy way to predict this to the physicians here, I'm guessing, is you can monitor their weight. And if they have a quick weight gain, it means they're retaining water and they're going to uh, have some heart failure issues. And so you don't need to come into a clinic to let your physician know that you gained five or ten pounds over the weekend and you're retaining water and you're struggling. That can so be done. That's special compensation during Thanksgiving and Christmas, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Um, think about co-located services. You know, you, you talked about nutrition and exercise. Very easy to co-locate health services there as well. What does it mean to develop uh, 
housing infrastructure that simply has the capacity for high-speed internet, simply has the capacity to put an iPad in a private, a small private room where that person can then Skype their provider, perhaps with the assistance of a resident services coordinator. And so if, if Kaiser Permanente has to choose between building a medical clinic with all that entails and all the ancillary staff, the mostly highly paid physicians that are gonna be practicing there, or funding a resident services coordinator in a telepresence room uh, in, in a housing uh, complex, that's a pretty easy choice if we can get to the same or better result with that second option. So we do need to think about money and al uh, resource allocation, but let's also be innovative around the way we're deploying those resources and the potential partnerships we can build that don't necessarily pivot just on money. That's great. Yeah, I would, I would echo, um, I think what we need is innovation. I think now is the time. And I think that uh, as the healthcare sector begins to, to, to pivot as the payment incentives, and I think it's, uh, you're seeing uh, slowly but surely upticks in the percentage of those uh, dollars that go to healthcare providers that are value-based, that have this new incentive package. And provider organizations are still trying to figure out exactly what to do in, these new, in this new environment, how to act differently, what, where to invest dollars in different ways. But as that's happening, I think we need to offer uh, and develop innovative new models. And I, I want to say that the, the challenge is we say the word, in, especially in healthcare, innovation all the time. But it's probably the most misused word, especially in, uh, in the context of healthcare. Because um, I would say that one of the best descriptions of it is that I've heard is that uh, we, we in healthcare think of innovation as if um, we're shipping goods uh, from uh, New York to London, and instead and we build a new ship that gets those goods there, instead of in 10 days, we can get it there in five. And, and that's, to us in healthcare, so often innovation. Innovation. Uh, in reality, that's just incremental improvement. Um, now, not bad incremental improvement, but still incremental improvement. Innovation is when you stop building ships, you start building airplanes. And actually, other sectors of our economy, for them, innovation isn't building an airplane. It's actually sending the schematics for that good straight to that customer or to a 3D printing uh, plant right near that customer and making it to their exact specifications and getting it to them in a matter of hours, not days. And I think that it's ultimately, that's where we need systems like healthcare and housing is to really think much bolder, much more aggressively. And I think technology is uniquely positioning ourselves to give us opportunities to do things very, very differently. I just one very practical area that I would, I would mention in, in, in housing, in particular in support of housing, I think we've got some amazingly successful congregate housing programs all across the country. I think we can do congregate housing exceptionally well for very, very complex individuals. We do not do it as well in scattered site situations. I think technology and other new models and thinking of different ways to engage individuals, we have to find ways to provide effective services to complex individuals. And I encourage you to think about how to provide those services. We do it pretty well in things like PACE, for, for the elderly with pace centers and such things, which are very successful models, um, but I haven't think, particularly for those with significant behavioral health challenges, I just don't think we do it as well, and I'd love to see new models to make that work. Yeah, and I, I call that PATCH, the Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Chronically Homeless. <laughs> you can steal that if you want. I don't... <laughs> That's good. Um, so just to kind of add on, mine's is very, very simple really just build more affordable housing for all vulnerable populations. So, you know, I think we just don't have enough of it. I think you incorporate technology, you incorporate the innovation, you incorporate all these pieces, but we literally just don't have enough. As a pediatrician, when I ask a six or seven year old what they want to be when they grow up, none of them say they want to be homeless. None of them say they want to be food insecure. None of them say they want to be on SNAP or TANF, right? These are not aspirational goals. The system really needs to support all across the entire life course folks to have access to affordable housing and really taking into consideration some of these nuances of what's happening in the community around safety and violence, trauma-informed care. The other thing that I'll challenge a little bit is particularly if you're thinking about a redevelopment um, of a property or kind of a rehab of a property and thinking about trauma-informed strategies. I had a call um, with someone earlier today about really taking the voices of the residents into consideration as you're making the plan 
for overall programs, services, and all interventions. So she gave me this one example where they talked to residents, and one of the pieces that they wanted to do in the redesign was to build an old school arcade with Pac-Man, Centipede, all your old school video games. And they literally said it was a place for them to decompress, and it was a place for them to kind of release that stress, and it was a place for them to have fun. Now, is that going to get to a healthcare cost piece? I can do a whole bunch of downstream by the time their stress is dealt with, it's not a therapist. It might not hit the pocketbook in the same way, but you're literally impacting someone's life in a much more robust way. So I also challenge you to kind of think about who you're serving, figuring out what the right questions are when you're serving that person, and don't be stunned by their response. It sometimes might not be co-location of a health center. Sometimes it's not what we're expecting. People want choice, they want access, and so I would really also challenge to be open to these different solutions that don't always fit sometimes in the box that I'm very much guilty of sometimes creating and I really think that that's critical to improving the health of those who we're serving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. So <laughs> we actually work with what we call a co-production model, which is we ask the residents what they want and uh, learned a lot about this from Tiffany, thank you. <laughs> and the results are really quite amazing because the first things our residents want is safety, access to um, uh, healthy food and, and, uh, and love. And this, and I just want, I, maybe I'll end with that, which is what we have found is when we really can create these thriving, engaged communities, we're working with a, a, a quality we call collective efficacy. And when you really see that kick in and radiate out to the neighborhood, uh, that's where you're really, you're getting not just resident impact, but you're getting really transformational impact. Fantastic. Well, we have put together, and hopefully you have um, uh, been witness to an amazing dream team of folks who are working at the intersection of health and housing. And so uh, to end our session to now, just uh, uh, invite you to join me in thanking our panelists for the enormous insight they shared. Thank you, Tiffany, and thank you to our panelists and Orion for just an amazing and passionate discussion. And this ends the discussion part of our uh, program today, but it doesn't end the discussion. So we're inviting all of you to go out to the Palm Court and uh, network and uh, continue the discussion over cocktails. But then let's not let the discussion end tonight. Let's carry the discussion out onward and not end that discussion, but let's get some results. So, so you are all, uh, if you would all adjourn out to the Palm Court and they're gonna transform this room for dinner. Thank you very much. I think you will all agree the panel this afternoon was fantastic. Um, <clears throat> Last year, we, last year we had our first symposium and dinner on pay for success, and we had no way of knowing it would catch on fire the way it did, uh, informing 300 attendees and 68 corporate sponsors. This year, I think, is a testimony to the subject matter. We have over 350 attendees and 76 corporate sponsors. I'd like to acknowledge our board members, starting with the three members who are co-chairing this event. And if you would please, as I, please stand up as I call your name, Ellis Carr, Sherry santos Wust, and Shel Schreiberg. Next, I'd like to recognize our staff for the important role they play every day. Uh, we truly have a terrific organization. As I usually say, when people come in to visit our office and they, people around the table start acknowledging themselves, I get the pleasure of sitting back and watching these talented people work. We'd also like to thank, uh, with a special thanks, Tom Vaccaro, Mary Jane Funes, Barbara Wolf, Maria Conticelli, Tatja Witzman, and Joseph Shokor, Josh Shokor, they were the ones that worked incredibly hard to put this event on. <laughs> we, 
We'd also like to thank tonight our 77 corporate sponsors for their generous support in helping NHPF continue with our mission. You see their names predominantly displayed this evening. Also, we thank our attendees, speakers, and panelists for their contribution to the housing and health conversation. It's especially rewarding to acknowledge everyone in the room tonight. The NHP Foundation will enter its 30th year in 2019, and all of you are partners in our endeavor to provide more than a roof for everyone in need. At this point, I'm excited to present awards to leaders who have helped shape the affordable housing industry through their work and who continue to make significant contributions to chart the industry course in the years to come. The first award is the NHP Affordable Housing Pioneer Award to Michael Bodakin, President National Housing Trust from 1993 to 2018. Let me tell you just a little bit about Michael. He spent 25 years with the National Housing Trust, leading NHT's growth into a major affordable housing organization. Under his leadership, the Trust won the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation Award for creative and effective institutions. Michael has been directly involved in providing technical assistance to multifamily affordable housing developments and was indicted into the Affordable Housing Finances Hall of Fame in 2012. I didn't even know they had a Hall of Fame. Um, please come collect your award, Michael. Well, I didn't remember being indicted, but... So housing is more than a home. Uh, everyone in this room knows that. When done right, housing is a platform to provide a better educational opportunity, better health opportunities and outcomes. And so it pleases me so much to take this award tonight from the NHP Foundation. But I must say it pleases me even more to be involved in a higher calling a higher calling that all of you are involved in, and that I appreciate the work you do every day for Americans who need shelter, who need education, who need health, and who desperately are out there seeking our help. Thank you, and thanks to the NHP Foundation. Thanks, Richard. Next, we'd like to honor Tom Amdor, Executive Director and Executive Vice President of the National Housing and Rehabilitation Association, and award him with the NHP Affordable Housing Advocacy Award. Tom is a tireless industry, industry advocate and a frequent speaker at affordable housing, sustainable development, and tax credit industry events. He's also frequently published in a variety of industry journals and he's part of a younger generation, people coming up in this industry that are very welcome and very, uh, we're very glad to see. So Tom, come on up. Well, uh, thank you so much, Dick. Thank you to the NHP Foundation tonight. Uh, this was really an unexpected honor for me and really made all the more special by coming up right after Michael Badakin, who's somebody that I've just looked up to and have tried to emulate throughout my career. Uh, when I joined NHNRA 14 years ago, I really wasn't uh, looking to be an advocate. I was really trying to get out of my job in government relations, doing work for telemarketers. And I, I, I honestly, I just wanted to try to make the world a little bit of a better place. And I really had no idea how fulfilling it would be doing work on behalf of, uh, of all of you guys. Um, you know, uh, the finding solutions to make affordable housing more attainable is obviously 
really compelling. It's, it's challenging work. Um, what we try to do at NHNRA is try to convene, try to educate, try to bring people together, try to find collective solutions. And, and when we're successful, when we change a program, enhance a, a resource, uh, the collective um, result is that all of you around the room, uh, financing, developing, operating, managing, building affordable housing, are able to do your jobs better. And that's really what it's all about. And uh, I'm just really grateful to work in an industry where I can assist so many good people doing such great work, um, really helping reach the most vulnerable members of our community. So thank you very much. I, I really appreciate this. Next, we'd like to recognize Monica Mitchell, Vice President, Community Development, Wells Fargo, with an NHPF Affordable Housing Advocacy Award. Monica has over 16 years' experience in banking, not-for-profit, and community relations. In her role, Monica leads Wells Fargo's social responsibility and community development work for the Maryland and greater DC regions. She is responsible for affording housing affordable housing workforce development, entrepreneurship, and financial education efforts for low to moderate income communities. Please come up, Monica. That is a surprisingly hefty award. <laughs> it's a good weight. Um, it is my honor to, uh, to receive this award tonight from the NHP Foundation. Thank you. Safe and affordable housing is a basic human right. And it is in my honor to work within Wells Fargo in this space to make sure that our systems work for the benefit of all within our communities. It was Dr. King who said in response to the promise of safe and affordable housing, that now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to open the doors of opportunity to all of God's children. I think that at the heart of this work is making sure that we don't forget that promise and work towards it with a sense of urgency that we all know that it is. Thank you so much for this honor, I appreciate it, thank you. It is now truly a pleasure for me to give the next award to an outstanding industry leader, Michael Novogratik, managing partner, Novogratik & Company. Michael is receiving the NHPF Affordable Housing Visionary Award. Michael has more than 30 years of experience specializing in affordable housing, community development, historic preservation, and renewal energy. He's the author of numerous real estate-related tax and accounting articles and books, including the New Markets Tax Credit Handbook, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Handbook, and Michael has been a tireless advocate for the LIHTC in Congress. Michael? Oh. Great. Uh, thank you, Dick. It's uh, truly an honor to receive this award, so I thank NH, uh, NHP Foundation for giving me the award. Uh, it was a great session this afternoon. Uh, I really liked what Ryan was talking about. He made me want to stand up here and talk to you all about the innovations in tax credit housing finance and opportunity zones. <laughs> but don't worry, don't worry. I'll, uh, I'll save that for another time. Uh, no, this really is a great uh, event that NHP puts on. And it is something that it's important, I think, for all of us to get together and talk about what's working as well as what isn't working. So we keep doing what's working and stop doing what's not working and find ways to fix the things that aren't working, uh, as well as to celebrate what it is that we have accomplished. It's important to take a moment to celebrate. It's also important to look at what hasn't been done yet and figure out how we're going to do it. So last year, we had pay for success. This year, we had health and housing. And I, for one, once again, want to thank uh, NHP Foundation for all that they do in pulling these events together. And I look forward to this being an annual 
event. Thank you very much. Maria Torres Springer, Commissioner of the New York Department of Housing Preservation and Development, is a devoted public official overseeing the nation's largest municipal housing agency. She also has to be a, happens to be a terrific panelist on our panel today. She is the recipient of the NHPF Affordable Housing Visionary Award. As commissioner, she is leading the charge to implement Mayor Bill de Blasio's housing plan which was recently accelerated and expanded through Housing New York 2.0 to complete the initial goal of 200,000 homes by 2022, two years ahead of schedule, and achieve an additional 100,000 homes over the following four years for a total of 300,000 homes by 2026. Commissioner Torres Springer, would you come up and get your award, please? Thank you, Dick, and thank you to the NHP Foundation. I'm incredibly honored to accept this award on behalf of all of the amazing people at HPD, and also it pleases me to be able to represent New York City tonight. I know so many in this room are either working in New York City or have spent some time really serving the people um, across the five boroughs. We face in New York City what so many other cities face as many, many people um, are voting for urban life. It's this moment where we both have to embrace and be proud of a lot of hard-fought successes as our population boom, booms, as our jobs are at an all-time high. But on the flip side of that, we are a city that is gripped by an affordability crisis, a crisis that leaves way too many people rent burden, a crisis that leaves way too many people in our shelters, um, and really has people um, feeling like they're losing their grasp in the neighborhoods that they love and help build. It's why we know that there is so much at stake it's why Mayor Bill de Blasio has committed to what is really an unprecedented um, set of resources and plans to build 300,000 homes by 2026. And we're a third of our way through that, but we know that we have to do more. But really, um, this is the reason why I'm happy to be in a room with a lot of people who are fighting this same noble fight. Because we all know that the work of affordable housing the work of delivering quality health care to residents across this country is really not just about serving individual people, but really is about uplifting entire communities. And what we also know is that the questions that we have to ask ourselves, the question that we have to ask our national leaders, is really not just one about how many units of affordable housing can we um, finance in any given year. It's not even one about what resources can be leveraged in the building or preservation of affordable housing. In many ways, it's a more fundamental question. It's a question of what type of city, really what type of country do we want to be? Is it the type of country where everyone has access to a safe, affordable, decent home? Or is it the type of country where seniors, people with chronic illnesses, working families, even children, have to worry about where they sleep at night? What I know is that the people in this room know full well what the answer to that question needs to be. And I'm just really proud to be part of a community that will fight to make sure that we answer the right questions properly. Thank you so much. And finally, I'd like to bring Patricia Diaz-Dennis, a wonderful and dedicated trustee of the NHP Foundation, to present a special award to a very special guest tonight. Please welcome Patricia. Thank you, uh, Dick. Uh, even though I'm fighting a cold, as you can hear, 
It was very important for me to be here tonight, not only because I love NHPF and I've been on the board for far too long now, um, but I wanted to induce, introduce the first ever NHPF Affordable Housing Leader Award and be here when it was given to Henry Cisneros, with whom I share a hometown. San Antonio is known for three things, the Alamo, the Riverwalk, and Henry Cisneros. It's a wonderful city that has birthed many progressive and socially caring organizations and people. I love this Texan saying when I moved to Texas 24 years ago, I wasn't born here, but I got here as soon as I could. <laughs> Henry was actually born in San Antonio. I'm equally privileged to introduce this person who has done so much for affordable housing during his stint as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. And we in San Antonio, of course, knew him as our mayor. Now, I first met Henry when I was a young lawyer in Los Angeles. It was in the late 70s. Yes, Henry was young then too, but I think I always looked younger than Henry. He spoke at a MALDEF dinner, the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund. I was the only Latina at the law firm I was in, and it was so wonderful to see him up on the dais speaking. And I knew then that this man would make a lasting, lasting impact, a real difference. He'd leave a legacy. I also remember his remark that he loved speaking to an audience where people could pronounce his name, Cisneros. And having been um, born in New Mexico but raised in North Carolina, the daughter of Porfirio Diaz and being known as Pat Diaz, I really sympathized with that, Henry. <laughs> At HUD, Henry oversaw the implementation of the HOPE 6 program, one of the most successful urban regeneration initiations in the past half century. Affordable housing is what it is today because of Henry's work. And today, Henry's company that's based in San Antonio, City View, is a partner in building more than 7,000 homes in 13 states. And finally, I personally applaud Henry's mentoring of the next generation of leaders, folks like the Castro brothers, Julian, who literally followed in your footsteps, Henry. He became mayor and then went on to be HUD secretary. And his brother, his twin brother, um, Joaquin, is, a, is a, currently a congressman. We're very honored tonight to have Secretary Cisneros with us. Thank you, Henry. Patricia, thank you very much. It's a special treat to be introduced by a longtime friend and a person who I've respected for so many years as a professional woman, as a board member of national corporations, um, as a civic leader nationally, including uh, nonprofit organizations such as this. She's given something like 15 years to this board but also served other national organizations, such as as chairperson of the Girl Scouts, for example. So she's a, a really uh, accomplished leader, and I'd ask you just once again to thank you, ask her to thank you for her civic service to the country. And I also want to express my respect for the other honorees this evening, Michael Badakin, Tom Amdur, Monica Mitchell, Michael Novogratik and Maria Torres Springer, all of whom we, we have observed their work, respected their work over the years, um, massive accomplishments that have touched many, many lives. And again, I'd like to ask you to join me once again in saying thank you and congratulations and respect. 
to those persons. Dick Burns, thank you for your leadership. Uh, Chair Ralph Boyd, thank you. And if I may take one moment of personal privilege, I want to single out a person who's in the audience whose work I've admired for a lot of years. Um, he grew up in the housing business, the traditional market-oriented housing business in New York, and then his life took a different turn as he really dedicated himself to creative, pioneering, uh, nonprofit work, um, and that is Jonathan Rose, who's, just, who's on the panel earlier, and I know is in the audience somewhere. Would you stand up and let us recognize you? Jonathan taught me over the years about a dimension of housing, which I'd never really thought about in my, my own work, which was housing as a transcendent kind of institution, home, if you will, as a transcendent place. Because yes, home is shelter, but it's a lot more than four walls and a roof, a dry place, a place to be safe when darkness comes. And it's a lot more than an economic transaction, although it's a major economic decision for every family. But when you break it down to its essence, home makes it possible for people to live their lives. The essential dramas of life, if you will, play out in these places we call home. Whether it's a single family detached home, whether it's a multifamily apartment, uh, whatever the form it might take, it's a place that we keep our possessions, which doesn't sound like a lot until you see an elderly woman walking down the street with a grocery basket with all of her possessions going down the street. And you think, how do people organize their lives, keep their medicines, uh, keep the food that they will need for the next meal? We do that in these places we call home that are safe and, and secure. It's a place where people gather for happy occasions like bringing a baby home from the hospital, just born, or, or a family birthday, or a Mother's Day celebration, and sad events, like a family that gathers for a wake and remembers the wonderful things about the person who has passed. It's a place where we nurture our children, sit around the family table and discuss everything from tomorrow's homework to the hoped-for vacation of the summertime. It's a place where people pray and share their deepest sense of their fears, their hopes, their ambitions uh, with their creator in the safe walls of, of home. And it's very often a place where people heal, whether it's something as simple as recovering from a minor cold or having to undergo a more extensive therapy as might be associated with cancer, for example. And all of this sense of what a home is has been hammered home to me on a number of different occasions. On uh, one occasion, it had to do with an earthquake, the um, Northridge earthquake in Los Angeles, where uh, the president asked us to fly out that day because uh, the roads were impassable and the Secretary of Transportation needed to be there and the head of FEMA, Federal Emergency Management, and I was asked to go because the estimate was there were 30,000 people out of their homes. It was Martin Luther King Day, January 17th, 1994, and we flew from Washington and were in Los Angeles by midday and found people uh, in parks, um, in school gymnasiums, uh, but, but they couldn't go back into their homes because the authorities were afraid that the next aftershock would bring down the houses and and, and, and hurt or kill more people. So the immediate job was to how do you find some kind of shelter for 30,000 people between 434 in the morning when the earthquake occurred and darkness and rain and cold coming that evening. And it drove home for me over and over the course of the next month that I was there just what exactly a home means. It's very clear to me uh, there is a connection between home and health. So the work that was done this afternoon focusing on that issue and the work that National NHP is doing in that respect is important. And again, 
little facts from my own experience draw it home. Um, we know that a person living with AIDS can now live almost indefinitely with the right cocktail of medicines. But the life, estimated lifespan of a person with AIDS on the street without a home is six months. So that's just a graphic sort of dramatic instance, but there's so many other evidences of the peace of mind that comes with having a safe place, the fact that older people want to stay in their, their own home for as long as they can, and as they can, and it has a lot to do with their sense of their own health. So as a country, we need to focus on housing. We have a housing shortfall in America, or we wouldn't have the dimensions of affordab unaffordability that we do. There's not one single metropolitan area in the United States, not one, where a person earning the minimum wage can afford the fair market rent on a two-bedroom apartment. It doesn't exist. So people end up in overcrowded conditions, evicted, moving to shelter. Fastest growing segment of homelessness is women with children. That's unconscionable in our country. Another fast growing segment of homelessness is aged people over 60 years of age. We have a serious housing problem and we have to address it. We cannot address all of the other social objectives we have, jobs, income, education, health, without a home, a place to live. So I applaud NHB for its work over all these years and these honorees who've been doing this work. But we have to focus on the problem of homelessness it's down from 850,000 people a night to about 650,000 people a night, and we've made some progress. Some cities are now able to say they have turned the corner and ended veterans' homelessness, for example. But we have these other forms of homelessness that, that continue to grow. Critical problem. Affordability, we've talked about that. Home ownership, still an important goal for our country as, we, as it, it has so much to do with the creation of a middle class. And oh, by the way, the connection between rental and affordable rental and the ability to, to eventually act upon the dream of home, of home ownership is a, is a close link. It matters. Uh, it's the, it's the, the hope for a, a future middle class, the backbone of our society, uh, frequently depends upon people being able to build up some equity. And for most Americans, the sum total of their equity or net worth is the value that they have in a home. And then we have the need to connect programs like housing and health, and housing and education, and housing and job training, and so many others. And finally, I would say we have an impending crisis in the inadequacy of housing for the aging tsunami that is about to, our country is about to witness. An aging tsunami in which the number of people over 65 years of age will double over the next several years, over the next de two decades. And the number of people over 85 years of age will triple. And the, 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 the housing that they're in today is simply not appropriate for an aging population. It's larger than they need. It's not accessorized properly. One of the big challenges we confront as a country. So as we think about the American future, both in traditional terms of greatness, but in other terms of decency and compassion and understanding the phases of life and the dynamics of life, we simply have to understand more clearly housing is the very base of it. I want to thank all of you who are here this evening to support NHP. Many of you in the housing finance, housing construction, housing design, uh, syndication, so many different aspects of the housing equation, but all committed to putting Americans into safe and decent housing. Thank you for your work. Thank you to NHP. And thank you to everyone associated with this effort.